as you can appreciate on the extreme left hand side you are having a pale or straw colored straw colored or amber colored urine as you can appreciate so this is a normal urine looks like this if you see over here this is a reddish color of urine seen in cases of hematuria hemoglobinuria or in cases of intravascular hemolysis now this color is deep yellow okay indicative of jaundice you can see a blackish or deep black or brownish urine over here what you can appreciate where you can see an alkaptonuria or in conditions of melanoma and this is a milky white urine as you can appreciate over here milky white urine which is basically indicative of filariasis okay these are the different colors of urine that we can appreciate over you. here uh, here is a very important example okay of the different grades of you know proteinuria that we can appreciate so over here you can you can see that there is no cloudiness so this is basically a negative test you can see very faint haziness over here so this is trace now over here what you can appreciate is the presence of some cloudiness is there but there is no granularity as such so this is one plus and no flocculants over here this is number two what you can appreciate over here that along with the cloudiness there is some amount of granularity which is present so it becomes two plus over here you can see very dot dot flocules have now arrived so there is heavy flocculation that is can be seen over here so this is three plus and four plus you can see a thick curdy white precipitate that is formed an entire coagulation happened over here you can see the entire coagulum over here so this is basically the four plus so okay. normally so you have to remember one thing that all the plasma proteins are present only in the serum okay that is in our body serum okay and only in the serum they will contain all the plasma proteins so if you carry out normal serum protein electrophoresis you will see an albumin band you will see alpha 1 alpha 2 globulin beta globulin and gamma globulin so this is the entire spectrum of the plasma protein normally none of these plasma proteins are not present in urine so normally none of the plasma proteins are not present in urine you have to remember this point okay so the first scenario over here as we see i'm talking about this first scenario so this is how the serum protein electrophoresis looks like normally with its spectrum of plasma proteins so in this first case what do we see we see just like in serum this urine protein electrophoresis shows a band over here for albumin and another band over here stands for transferrin so over here we see that only low molecular weight protein is entering in urine or they are present in urine such kind of you know proteinuria wherein the proteins are, are predominantly low molecular weight they are called as select selective proteinuria this is called as selective proteinuria okay now after this we have to understand the second example over here on the uh, on the left hand side again we can see the spectrum of serum protein uh, you know uh, uh, serum plasma proteins that we see under electrophoresis okay and now we compare now we see that along with the albumin all the other larger molecular weight proteins are also appearing in the urine so both low molecular weight along with that uh, the uh, the higher molecular weight plasma proteins are also appearing and the urine protein electrophoresis is very much similar to the serum protein electrophoresis so such kind of proteinuria is called as non selective proteinuria it is called as non selective proteinuria now the third example over here that we see it is that of tubular proteinuria it is that of tubular proteinuria and we will discuss in details what tubular proteinuria is in a while right now myself dr jibran amar presents to you simply pathology and today we are back with a very important lecture today onwards we are going to start the clinical pathology classes and today the first topic of discussion is the urine examination now urine examination is very very important not only for the undergraduate but also for the post graduate students of pathology why it is very important because it is constituting up to 20% marks of your practical examination okay so it is very very important so today we are going to see the part 1 of the urine examination wherein we are going to discuss in details about the physical examination of urine followed by the chemical examination today we will only discuss the protein examination okay under the chemical examination of urine so let us begin today's topic of discussion without wasting any more time now before we you know uh, uh, go and understand about the you know urine examination it is very important for us to understand that how does a urine report of a normal adult looks like okay it is very very important because 
there are many parameters that you have to see. Three important parameters are there. So you have physical parameters of a urine. Then you have certain chemical parameters. You have to carry out certain chemical examination. And then you are having microscopic examination. So before we you know uh, uh, start on with our journey of urine examination we have to first understand that what are the normal physical characteristics of a normal urine what are the normal chemical characteristics and what are the normal microscopic findings that we see in a normal urine okay without knowing this we cannot you know detect the abnormalities so it is very important to understand each and every parameter and what is the normal range for that parameter okay so let us see a normal report of a normal individual so first we will see the physical and the chemical examination okay so what are the physical parameters to look out so number one we have the quantity what is the normal quantity of a urine there is a range it is 6 to 1200 ml per 24 hour then we are having the odor what is the normal odor it is faint aromatic then what is the color it is pale yellow to colorless then what is the appearance it is clear now normally in urine there is no sediment at all and the range of uh, you know the specific gravity for a normal urine is 1.003 to 1.030 and then lastly we are having the ph the ph of a urine is slightly acidic in the range of 6 to 6.8 now remember these are the seven important physical parameters okay now in some of the books they have included ph under the chemical examination and you know so this is not something to become worried about if it is so if your university is stating the ph under the chemical examination then you might write the same in your exams or you might say the same in your vivas okay so these are the important physical parameters with their normal values now what are some of the normal you know chemical parameters that we see and what are you know their values okay so if you see for proteins there are two tests one test is just going to detect whether protein is present or not that is the qualitative test and another test is the quantitative test so under the heading of qualitative test remember normally this test comes out to be negative in a normal individual whereas the quantitative test okay it is stating approximately 150 mg per 24 hour okay so there is less than 150 mg protein per 24 hours in a normal adult and if you see the amount of a specific protein that is albumin it is less than 30 mg per 24 hours this is very important to understand so normally qualitatively proteins are absent quantitatively less than 150 milligram protein in a 24 hour urine sample and if you become more specific if you take albumin into account then it is less than 30 milligrams per 24 hours coming to the next parameter that is the glucose again there are two types of tests one test is going to detect the presence of glucose another is going to detect the amount of glucose so qualitatively glucose is always absent in a normal urine whereas quantitatively it is less than 500 milligrams per 24 hours or less than 15 milligrams per deciliter okay so this is a normal amount of glucose that can be found in a normal urine sample then we are having certain uh, you know parameters like the ketones okay ketones are there bilirubin that is the bile pigment bile salts occult blood or myoglobin all these parameters are always negative or nil they are they are never present okay then we are having the urobilinogen again urobilinogen is present in the range of 0.5 to 4 milligrams per 24 hours so this is the normal range of the chemical parameters so i hope it is very clear what are the physical parameters what are the chemical parameters okay individually we are going to see each of these parameters in details okay so don't worry about that now microscopic examination of a normal urine sample okay if you look at a normal urine sample so there are certain parameters so what are those parameters number one the pus cells so it is in the range of zero to two per high power field then rbcs if you see occasionally it is around one to two rbcs per high power field epithelial cells it is approximately two to three per high power field for males and eight to ten per high power field in case of females if you look at the cast okay so they are occasionally you can see highline cast per low power field it is occasional highline cast per low power field is considered normal Crystals, so calcium oxalate crystals in acidic urine and phosphates and biodates in alkaline urine are considered to be normal. And if you look at microorganisms, so they are nil, they are not found in normal urine. So these are the microscopic parameters. Okay. What are the basic indications for urine analysis? When is it that the urine analysis is carried out? It is done basically 
for detection of urinary tract infection. So, for example, a person has presented to you with fever, with burning micturition. So, in that situation, you will carry out urine analysis. Then for detection and for management of diabetes mellitus, for example, to know whether microalbuminuria is there or no, because microalbuminuria is, you know, uh, the earliest stage of microvascular disease. So once you can detect that, you can tightly control diabetes. Okay. Now suspected, when you are suspecting a renal disease like glomerular nephritis, nephrotic syndrome or pyelonephritis and renal failure, in those conditions, you are going to carry out, you know, urine analysis. Then when you are suspecting some plasma cell dyscrasia like multiple myeloma, primary amyloidosis, in those conditions, we are going to order such tests. Even for diagnosis of pregnancy, we can go for urine test and differential diagnosis of jaundice. Now mind it, this differential diagnosis of jaundice is a very important exam, short note. Okay, so it is asked in the exam and we will discuss in details under the chemical examination. Now we are going to understand about the collection of urine, not only the collection, also the timing of that particular collection of urine. So, uh, you know, the first morning midstream urine sample, it is preferred for routine urine examination. Early morning urine sample is concentrated and it has an acidic pH in which the formed elements of urine, what are the formed elements, all the cells and all the casts that we had seen under the microscopic examination, they are quite well preserved. So that is why an early morning urine sample is preferred. So this question is always asked in the exam and students are not able to answer. So what is the reason why early morning urine sample is preferred? Because the urine is concentrated, has an acidic pH in which the formed elements like the cells and cars, they are well preserved. So you can carry out, you know, the microscopic examination, you know, very nicely. Okay. Now, after voiding the initial half of the urine into the toilet, a part of urine is collected in the bottle. So why is it that the first half of the urine is discarded? Because the first half of the stream serves to flush out any contaminating cells microbes from the urethra and the perineum that is where we are taking the midstream sample so now you know that for routine urine examination the first morning midstream urine sample is preferred why first morning and why midstream so both the questions are discussed over here okay then we are having a random midstream now for example sometimes it is not possible always to take the morning uh, you know sample so you can go for a random midstream sample for routine urine examination also but for routine examination the preferred is the first morning midstream sample okay then we are having the first morning midstream but a clean catch sample now suppose if you have to carry out not a routine but you have to carry out a special bacteriological examination Okay, so in those case, you need a clean catch sample. So how do you take a clean catch sample? So everything is the same like the first morning midstream. But in case of men, the glans penis is sufficiently exposed and cleaned with soap and water before you are going to collect the sample. Similarly, in case of women, the urethral opening should be exposed. They are washed with soapy cotton balls, rinsed with water saturated cotton and holding the labia apart. This method of collection avoids any contamination of urine. So, they are very important for bacteriological or microbiological example, uh, examination. Now, postprandial sample, it is collected two hours after a meal in afternoon. Sometimes it can be requested for estimation of glucose to monitor the insulin therapy in diabetes or it can also be used for the measurement of urobilinogen. Then we have what is known as a 24-hour urine collection method. Now, this 24-hour urine collection is very important to estimate the quantitative amount of proteins or hormones in the urine. So, quantitative estimation of protein is carried out and for that purpose, we require a 24-hour urine sample or for, you know, uh, you know, estimation of hormones, we require a 24-hour urine sample. After getting, now what is the process? So, after getting up in the morning, the first urine has to be discarded. All the urine which is voided subsequently during the rest of the day and the night is collected in a large bottle and it should be a clean bottle of 2 litre capacity at least, okay, and that should have a cap. Now, the first urine after getting up in the morning on the next day is also collected and now your sample collection finishes. Now, the urine uh, uh, should be preserved between 4 to 6 degrees during the period of collection in the 24 hours and the container is then immediately transported to the laboratory. The urine is thoroughly mixed and an aliquot is used for testing. This method is used mainly for quantitative estimation of proteins and hormones. Okay, then we are having catheterized sample. That means when are you going to take the, the urine sample that is collected in a catheterized urine bag? 
So basically, bacteriological exam. Whenever there is an indication of bacteriological examination in case of infants, or in those patients who are bedridden, or in those patients who are having obstruction of the urinary tract, then in that case we will take catheterized sample. Again, you know, sometimes you have to carry, you know, you have to take urine in a specialized plastic bag. Okay, for example, colostomy bag. It is tied around the genitals in case of infant. Now, for bacterial examination, again, you can just attach a plastic bag around the genitals in case of infants. Okay, now urine uh, sometimes can also be collected, you know, for bacterial examination, sometimes urine can be collected directly from the bladder by passing a needle. Okay, so you can, uh, you know, just pass a, you, you know, uh, you, you can pass a basic needle just above the bladder, okay, above the symphysis pubis and you can collect the urine directly from there. Or in those individuals who are incontinent adults who cannot hold the urine, so incontinent adults, we can use a plastic bag as well, okay. So, these are the different methods of collection of urine. I hope you have understood this in details. Okay. Now, where it's very important that the urine sample, it must be tested in the laboratory within two hours of collection so as to get correct results, okay. Why? Because there are certain changes which occurs in the urine at, you know, sta on standing. So, as we already know that, you know, what are the changes that takes place in the urine, you know, when it is left outside. So, very, very importantly, as we know, first of all, urine on standing, okay, they becomes ammonical. There is a production of ammonia from urea by ureas producing bacteria and as a result, there is an increase in the pH of the urine, okay. So, this is the first change. So, there is the pH can change. The pH increases becomes more alkaline. Secondly, there is a formation of crystals due to the precipitation of phosphates and calcium making the urine turbid. And then in that case, you might falsely think that there is some abnormality in the urine because urine on standing can become turbid also because of formation of crystals. Then we have loss of ketone bodies. Okay. Now, loss of ketone bodies uh, uh, can occur because they are volatile and they can become loss again giving erroneous results. There can be decrease in the glucose because of unchecked glycolysis and utilization of glucose by the cells and bacteria. Then there is oxidation of bilirubin to biliverdin can occur causing false negative test for bilirubin that can occur on standing. Oxidation of urobilinogen to urobilin causing false negative test for urobilinogen. There can be bacterial proliferation and false positive test of you know, uh, uh, you know bacterial uh, you know growth. This integration of cellular elements can occur especially in alkaline and hypotonic urine. So, these are the changes which occurs in standing urine at room temperature. Again, this is a very important exam question that is asked to you in your VIVAS. Okay. After that, how do you preserve a urine sample? Now, it is not always possible. Now, ideally, in the ideal situation, the urine sample should be examined within 1 to 2 hours of voiding or parsing urine. Okay. Refrigeration around 4 to 6 degrees centigrade is the best general method of preservation of urine up to 8 hours. Okay. Before analysis, the refrigerated sample should be warmed to the room temperature. Okay. So, ideally, urine should be examined within 1 to 2 hours. Okay. But this is not always possible. And in those situations, the urine should always be preserved. Okay. In a refrigerator around 4 to 6 degrees centigrade. Okay. And such a refrigeration can, you know, uh, you know, store the sample or can preserve the sample for up to 8 hours only. And when you want to examine that refrigerated sample, you should always leave the sample outside and it should be warm to the room temperature. Now, for routine analysis, preservatives should be avoided as they will interfere with the reagent strip techniques that we use, okay, and the chemical test for the protein. So, you should not use preservatives, okay. But for example, for example, in situations, you know, you, in, there are certain situations where you have to use chemical preservatives. So, chemical preservatives used for urine collection usually present, prevent decomposition and contamination by the bacteria and the fungi. So, let us see what are the chemical preservatives which are used. Again, this is very important from MCQ point of view. So, concentrated hydrochloric acid. It is used for the preservation of 24-hour urine sample for, you know, estimation of adrenaline, noradrenaline vanyl mandelic acid and steroids 10 ml is used per 24 hour urine sample okay then we are having toluene it forms how does toluene act they act as a you know it forms a thin layer over the surface of urine and acts as a physical barrier for bacteria and air it is used for measurement of certain chemicals then boric acid 1 percent boric acid is the general preservative especially for hormones and 1 gram is added to 100 ml of urine 
Then we have thymol. It is inhibiting the growth of bacteria and fungi. And then we have formalin. It is an excellent chemical for preservation of formed elements of uh, you know, urine like the cells and cast. Okay, one drop is is used in 15 ml of urine. So these are the different kinds of preservatives. Ideally, all these preservatives should be avoided. But if it is required, then they can be used in such situations as discussed. Now we are going to start the discussion of the physical examination of urine, wherein we are going to discuss about individually about the volume, odor, color, specific gravity, appearance and the pH of urine. So let us begin today's topic of discussion. First, we are going to start with the volume. So the basic average 24-hour urinary output in adults is 600 to 2000 ml. Now, the volume varies according to the fluid intake, diet and climate. Now, what are the abnormalities of urine volume? So, it is very important to understand what is polyuria, what is oliguria, what is anuria. So, polyuria means when the urinary volume is more than 2 liters per 24 hour. And it is seen in conditions like diabetes mellitus where the cause is osmotic diuresis or diabetes insipidus where the cause is failure of secretion of antidiuretic hormone. Chronic renal failure, where there is a loss of concentrating ability of the kidneys, or if the patient is in any kind of diuretic therapy. Oliguria means when the urine volume is less than 400 ml per 24 hours. Some books also stated as less than 600, okay, but standardized value is 400. The causes include febrile states, acute glomerulonephritis, congestive cardiac failure, and dehydration. Now, anuria. What is anuria? Anuria means urinary output of less than 100 ml per 24 hours or complete cessation of urine output. It occurs in conditions of acute tubular necrosis, acute glomerulonephritis and complete urinary tract obstruction. So, this is basically and most importantly, okay, all the different, you know, causes of increased and decreased urine volume, okay, and their respective causes. Then now we are going to understand about the urine odor. Now freshly voided urine has a faint aromatic odor because of the presence of certain volatile organic acids. Now after standing, the urine develops ammonical odor. Why? Because of the formation of ammonia, okay, when urea is decomposed by the bacteria. Now what are some of the abnormal odors of urine and what are the respective causes? Now, if it is having a fruity smell, okay, then it is indicating the presence of ketone bodies as in conditions of diabetic ketoacidosis or in severe starvation, okay. Then we are having mousy or musty flavor or musty smell in case of phenylketonuria. Sometimes you get a smell of a rotten fish, a very putrid and bad smell. Now, this is indicative of urinary tract infection with proteus or even in cases of tyrosinemia. You are having a smell of rotten fish. Then we have ammonical or pungent. Now, this is very commonly, you know, seen in our country where, you know, anyone who is doing, you know, public urination, if you go to any such public toilet, so you will have a classical smell, okay, that is ammonical or even pungent smell. So, old, very old standing urine has ammonical or pungent odor and not only that, even uh, when there is a urinary tract infection with Escherichia coli, we also get ammonical or pungent odor. Foul smelling urine again is can, can be seen in any kind of urinary tract infection just like we have seen the putrid, okay. In urinary tract infection with protease, we get a smell of rotten fish. Now coming to the color of urine. Now normal urine color in a fresh state is pale yellow or amber and it occurs because of the presence of various pigments collectively called as urochrome. Now the color of urine is also dependent on the state of hydration, okay, of our body. So, very importantly, when we are overhydrated, then the urine might be colorless. But sometimes when we are dehydrated, okay, then we ha can have a dark yellow urine. Now, some of the abnormal colors associated uh, with the conditions are, so colorless urine, you can get in a dilute urine. So, when you are overhydrated or in certain other conditions like diabetes insipidus or diabetes mellitus, you might get a colorless urine. Reddish or, you know, pinkish red color might indicate hematuria as an in intravascular hemolysis. Hemoglobinuria, porphyria, myoglobinuria. Deep yellow or yellowish green is indicative of presence of bile pigments like bilirubin and biliverdin. Milky white urine is seen in conditions of chyluria because of filariasis. Orange or orangish brown is indicative of presence of urobilinogen or porphyrobilinogen. Yellow, 
Sometimes the urine is just deep yellow. It might be occurring because of a dehydrated condition or just it might be a concentrated urine. Okay, so normally also this can be seen. Dark brown or black urine can occur in conditions of alkaptonuria or melanoma. Now let us see the different colors of urine. So as you can appreciate on the extreme left hand side, you are having a pale or straw colored, straw colored or amber colored urine as you can appreciate. So this is a normal urine looks like this. If you see over here, this is a reddish color of urine seen in cases of hematuria, hemoglobinuria or in cases of intravascular hemolysis. Now this color is deep yellow. Okay, indicative of jaundice. You can see a blackish or deep black or brownish urine over here. What you can appreciate where you can see an alkaptonuria or in conditions of melanoma. And this is a milky white urine as you can appreciate over here. Milky white urine which is basically indicative of phyleriasis. Okay, these are the different colors of urine that we can appreciate over here. Now the appearance of urine. Now normally freshly voided urine is clear in appearance. Now foamy urine occurs mainly when there is excess amount of proteins or bilirubin. Okay, in those conditions. Now there can also be you know a foamy urine can also occur if you know the urine is long standing and not examined within two hours. Then again it can occur because of the presence of phosphates in urine. Okay, so what are the causes of cloudy or turbid urine? Okay, very important. The first is the presence of amorphous phosphates. Okay, so the appearance is white and cloudy on standing in alkaline urine. So if your urine has been standing and it is an alkaline urine, okay, so in that condition, okay, uh, in, in that condition basically the amorphous phosphates, okay, they will turn white and cloudy. So what you can do over here, the diagnosis that there is presence of amorphous phosphates can be made, you know, it, uh, such kind of cloudiness will disappear on the addition of a drop of diluted acetic acid okay so by addition of dilute acetic acid okay such uh, you know cloudiness will disappear then we can have presence of amorphous urates okay which is cloudy pink and cloudy and they are present in acidic urine okay again they will dissolve on warming okay so amorphous phosphates and urates can cause cloudiness and the, the diagnosis is based on whether it is present in alkaline or acidic urine and subsequently, if you are adding acid and if it is, you know, uh, you know, disappearing, then it is amorphous urates. And subsequently, if it is, you know, dissolving and warming, then it is presence of amorphous urates. Okay, then we are having the presence of pus cells. Now, pus cells can cause varying grades of cloudiness or turbidity. So, how you can, uh, you know, uh, uh, diagnose the presence of pus cells very clearly, very importantly, you can go for microscopic examination. Again. You can, you know, you have to differentiate the, you know, the pus cells or purulent discharge from a milky discharge. So, what you will do, you carry out, you know, centrifugation. On carrying out centrifugation, okay, this, uh, you know, whitish or this turbidity is going to become clear and disappear. Whereas, fat or chyle in the urine does not clear on centrifugation. Whereas, the pus cells will clear on centrifugation. So, this is a very important point of difference. So, how do you, you know, you know differentiate between a purulent versus a um, you know a chyle or a fat in urine so if you are carrying out centrifugation and if the you know turbidity or the cloudiness goes away then it is because of the presence of pus cells but if it doesn't then it indicates presence of fat or chyle then presence of bacteria now they will be uniformly cloudy and they will not settle at the bottom following centrifugation again you have to go for microscopy and other tests like the nitrite test so as to you know, uh, uh, so as to establish the presence of bacteria. So, this is basically the appearance. As you can appreciate over here, this is a whitish color or cloudy, okay, cloudy or even you can say milky appearance is there. So, very importantly, with microscopy, okay, if you do microscopy and you see the presence of excess amount of pus cells, so you can, in that situation, you can confirm the diagnosis. Other thing is, if you carry out centrifugation, if the cloudiness, if it disappears, it is indicating the presence of pus cells. If the cloudiness remains, then it indicates the presence of either fat or chyle, okay, which does not disappear after centrifugation. Next very important, uh, you know, uh, parameter in place is the specific gravity. Now, what is the specific gravity? It is a measure of concentrating ability of the kidneys and it is determined, uh, you know, 
and it is determined to get information about the tubular function of the kidneys okay now it depends on the amount of solutes so specific gravity is depending on the amount of solute that is present in a solution and it is basically a comparison of the density of the urine against density of distilled water at a particular temperature the specific gravity of distilled water is 1.000 Whereas the specific uh, gravity of a normal urine is in the range of 1.003 to 1.030 and depends on the state of hydration. So basically specific gravity is reflecting the amount of solutes that is present in a particular urine sa sample. Now specific gravity of normal urine is mainly uh, there because of the presence of urea and sodium because these are the only solutes which are present in urine. Specific gravity increases as the solute concentration will increase. So, for example, if the amount of protein increases, so specific gravity will increase. Or, for example, if the urine is diluted or if there is a reduced amount of solute, then the concentration of solute will come down. So, again, the specific gravity will decrease. Okay. So, specific gravity increases as the solute concentration increases and decreases when the temperature rises. Because when the temperature is rising, the volume is also expanding. Okay. So, so, this is very, very important. Now, specific gravity is affected by proteinuria and glycosuria. So, whenever there is glucose in urine or whenever there is protein in urine, so the net amount of solutes is going to rise. So, as a result, the specific gravity will also rise. So, what are the causes of increase in specific gravity of urine? It is diabetes mellitus, okay, because there is glucose in urine. So, solutes have increased. Nephrotic syndrome, because there is protein inside of urine. So, increased amount of protein causing increase specific gravity in conditions of fever and in condition of dehydration in dehydration there is increased amount of solutes okay with the, you know the solute concentration increases why because the amount of water is less so all these are conditions associated with increased specific gravity mainly diabetes and nephrotic syndrome what are the causes of of decrease in the specific gravity of urine so in any condition when the urine is becoming dilute as in conditions of diabetes insipidus, the specific gravity consistently between 1.002 and 1.003. In conditions of chronic renal failure, the specific gravity no, not only becomes low, but it becomes fixed. And this is called as isothenuria, wherein the specific gravity is fixed at 1.010. And this occurs because of loss of the concentrating ability of the kidney tubules. And lastly, compulsive water drinking. If you are drinking a lot of water, in that situation, again, the specific gravity is going to fall, okay? Now, there are different methods for, you know, measuring the specific gravity. The most common and commonly followed method is a urinometer method. Then we have refractometer method and we have a reagent strip method. So, we will see individually these methods. The first and the most commonly used method, which is also asked in the exam, is the urinometer method. So, this method is basically based on the principle. What is the principle? It's a principle of buoyancy. It is the ability of the fluid to exert. Over here, the fluid is nothing but the urine. So, it is the ability of the urine to exert an upward thrust on a body which is placed on it. Okay, this is the principle of buoyancy and this is basically used to measure the specific gravity. So, a basic, uh, so, so the apparatus used is called as a urinometer, also called as the hydrometer. Okay, this is basically the hydrometer or the urinometer as we can appreciate over here. This is the urinometer or the hydrometer. Now, what is done that this urinometer is basically placed in a container which is filled with urine. So, for example, this is the container and this container has been filled with urine. So, what we are going to do that we are basically going to place this particular urinometer in this particular vessel which is containing urine. So, this urine depending on the amount of solute which is present is going to give an upward thrust. Okay. And then, you know, the level at which, you know, we will see there is a bifurcation and there is a level over here. So, the level of this reading will is, is the specific gravity of that particular urine. So, when the solute concentration is high in the urine, the up thrust of the solution will increase. So, the urinometer is going to be pushed up. So, for example, the reading will be somewhere over here. So, the reading will be high. But if the solute concentration of the urine is low, so the urinometer is going to sink further. And as a result, you will get a, get a reading over here somewhere. So, you will have a low specific gravity reading. I will just explain this concept once again for everyone so that you are, you know, so you, that you don't miss anything. So, let me just explain it once again. So, for example, this is a container which is containing urine. Okay, this is a container which is containing urine. And for example, this is a urinometer over here that we have basically kept over here. And this is basically the urine. 
Now what happens and this particular container if you see this is having some you know some markings are there in this particular albuminometer okay this albuminometer sorry this uh, urinometer is basically having certain reading over here okay this is a urinometer and this urinometer is basically having certain gradations or certain markings over here. Now for example the first situation when the urine is basically uh, you know uh, is having an increased amount of solute so it is highly packed with solute so in that condition what is going to happen that we will get a reading okay what is going to happen this urine is going to push this particular urinometer up so we will get a very high reading okay we will get a high reading so the specific gravity will become high in case the urine is very dilute and contains a less amount of solute so what is going to happen in this condition this particular urinometer is going to sink further and as a result because it is going to sink further so as a result okay we are going to get a reading you know you know quite you know down so you are going to get a lesser reading of specific gravity in this situation so what is the method you may you fill a measuring cylinder with 50 ml of urine so this is the measuring cylinder over here that we can appreciate you lower the urinometer gently into the urine and let it float freely so this is the urinometer you just place it in this particular cylinder containing urine now let the urinometer settle it should not touch the sides or the bottom of the cylinder Take the reading of the specific gravity on the scale that is the lowest point of the meniscus. So, what is the meniscus? So, over here, if this is a urinometer, so this is the lowest point of the meniscus. So, the reading should be taken at this particular point. At the lowest point of the meniscus, you have to take the re reading. I just let me show you once again. So, this is a urinometer. So, this is the lowest point of the meniscus. Over here, the reading has to be taken. Okay. Take out the urinometer and immediately note also the temperature of the urine with a thermometer because specific gravity okay, changes with temperature. So, it is very important that we also note the temperature of the room because whatever device we are using, the specific gravity is calibrated for that particular device only. So, we might have to change the specific gravity with respect to the temperature. So, some correction of the reading is to be made based on the temperature as well as the protein or glucose content of the urine. To get the corrected specific gravity, add 0 0.001 to the reading for every 3 degree centigrade that the urine temperature is above the temperature of calibration. So, always with that particular urinometer, there will be written that the temperature at which the device was calibrated, for example, it was around, uh, you know, 37 degrees Celsius. But for example, you saw the room temperature, it was approximately uh, 40 degrees, for example. So, for every reading that is 3 degrees centigrade, that it is above the temperature, okay. So, what you will have, you will have to multiply it by 0 0.001, okay. So, for example, if the uh, calibration of the device was 37 degrees centigrade, and basically you are measuring at 40 degree centigrade, okay. So, whatever, you know, result you are getting of specific gravity, because it is, uh, you know, 3 degree centigrade more, so you multiply it by 3. So, whatever specific gravity you are getting, okay, with the device, you have to add 0 0.003. Now, for example, if the room temperature now on the other hand becomes 33 degree centigrade, so you will just subtract it, okay. So, specific gravity should be subtracted by 0 0.003, okay. So, is this point very clear to everyone? This should be actually 34 degree centigrade, okay. So, in this particular situation as we see over here, for every rise of temperature, you have to either add or subtract 0 0.001 depending on whether the temperature is above or below the calibrated temperature, okay. Okay, not only this, it is also necessary to nullify the effect of glucose or protein. So, how do we do that? Again, uh, we have to, you know, 0 0.003 is subtracted from temperature corrected, uh, you know, specific gravity for each 1 gram of protein per deciliter of urine that is present. Or, uh, you know, you have to subtract 0 0.004 for every 1 gram of glucose per deciliter that is present in the urine. So, this is the correction for the presence of glucose or proteins in the urine, okay. So, this is how you measure the specific gravity, okay. Now, there are other methods like the refractometer method. Now, in, uh, you know, in uh, bigger labs, you are, uh, they are using the refractometer method because now no one is using this urinometer method that is you know taking a lot of time so you have to you know it is very time consuming so now people are using refractometer method so over here by this method a specific gravity can be precisely determined by a, a device that is called as a refractometer this is measuring the refractive index of the total soluble solids which are present in the urine 
higher the concentration of the dissolved solids like the uh, like the glucose and the proteins higher will be the refractive index so the extent of refraction of a beam of light passed through the urine is a measure of the solute concentration and thus of the specific gravity the method is very simple and it requires only one to two drops of urine the result is read from a scale or from a digital display then we are having the reagent strip method this is actually the most commonly used method now in the laboratories so what happens that you are having a reagent strip like this okay so this is the reagent strip that you can appreciate okay so this is for example for a specific gravity okay and there is a scale for example there are multiple scales for multiple parameters and against this particular scale whatever color you are getting you have to match it against that particular scale and whatever reading is given over there then you will you know take that as a particular reading so this is not only for specific gravity but the reagent strips are present even for the proteins for the glucose for all the different chemical examinations also you are having reagent strip test okay so this this is also called as a dipstick method so the reagent strip measures the concentration of the ions which are present in the urine which correlates with the specific gravity now depending on the ionic strength of urine a poly electrolyte will ionize in proportion to that okay so uh, for example if there is uh, some amount of glucose or some amount of protein so depending on the amount of glucose and protein present the, uh, you know uh, an amount of poly electrolyte is going to ionize and depending on the amount of this poly electrolyte that is going to ionize there will be a change in color okay of an indicator that is there usually there is a bromothymol blue which is present and once there is a change in the color depending on whatever the uh, color is changing that can be matched against a particular reading and then we can get a specific gravity reading okay understand so this is basically the reagent strip method that is classically used then lastly among the physical parameters we are having the reaction and the ph so the ph is a scale for measuring acidity or alkalinity so the urine ph is said to be acidic if it is less than 7 it is neutral if it is 7 and if it is more than 7 it is called as alkaline so on standing the urine becomes alkaline because of loss of carbon dioxide and production of ammonia from urea therefore for correct estimation of the ph only fresh urine should be examined there are various methods for determination of a uh, reaction of the urine so let us see what are the different methods number 1 we have the litmus paper test that we already have seen in our you know from when we were children you know in our chemistry labs we used to have the litmus paper so a small strip of litmus paper is dipped in urine and any color change is noted if blue litmus is changing red then the urine is acidic and if it occurs vice versa if red is turning blue it is indicating alkaline urine so i will just show you this litmus paper test so you can see this is basically the blue litmus is turning red so this is basically acidic urine similarly if red is turning blue okay then it is a basic or it's an alkaline urine okay so this test cannot give us any measure okay what is the exact ph it is just telling it us whether a particular urine sample is acidic or it is basic in nature okay next we are having the ph indicator paper here in what happens just like the reagent strip test here the reagent area is impregnated with a dye like bromothymol blue and methyl red okay so here the reagent area which is impregnated with certain dyes okay of the indicator paper strip is dipped in the urine sample and the color change is compared with the color guide which is provided so depending on the color we can even tell you what is the acidity if it is acidic or basic they will tell you but they will also tell you okay how much acidic whether it is 5 acidic 5.5 6 6.2 how much it is is the acidic nature so that you will get an exact reading again over there you will get a range then we have a ph meter which is a device which is dip which is when dipped in the urine sample okay the ph can be read out directly from the digital displays it is used when exact ph is required okay then we have reagent strip test as i told you the ph indicator paper is there so there is a reagent strip test the test area is containing polyanionic polymer which is bound to h plus on reaction with the cations in the urine the h plus is released causing a change in color of the ph sensitive dye and whenever there is a change in color that can be compared with a particular comparator okay and depending on the color that is produced you can tell whether the urine is acidic or basic and you can also give the range how much acidic normal ph of urine is approximately 6 to 6.8 it is slightly acidic urine ph depends on the diet depends on acid base balance water balance and the renal tubular function acidic urine is found in conditions of ketosis so it is very important it is uh, present in conditions of diabetic ketoacidosis in starvation again there can be ketosis or in case of fever 
acidic urine is also present when there is a urinary tract infection with Escherichia coli and in conditions of high protein diet. Whereas alkaline urine may result from urinary tract infection by bacteria that splits urea to ammonia like the Proteus or Pseudomonas. Severe vomiting, vegetarian diet, old ammonical urine sample as well as chronic renal failure. So these, so these are the, some of the important questions that will be asked. Okay, so what are the methods? Okay, and what are the, you know, the conditions where you can have acidic as well as alkaline urine? Not only this, determining the pH of urine is also, you know, helping us in identifying the various crystals in urine. So, when we are going to read about the microscopic examination, we are going to see that certain crystals are present in acidic urine, certain crystals are present in basic urine. So, whenever you are examining a particular slide, okay, so if you know the pH, then you can have, you can narrow down the differential diagnosis as to what kind of crystal it is, okay. So, altering the pH of the urine may be useful in also treatment of certain condition. Now, for example, if a person is suffering from renal calculi, that is some stones are forming only in the acidic urine. For example, uric acid calculi, in such cases, the urine is kept alkaline. So, basically, you know, you, you are also checking the urine, okay, in case you are giving certain treatments, okay. So, in case the urine is, is basically alkaline, so, what happens that uric acid calculus is forming and renal stones basically form, especially the uric acid calculus is formed in acidic urine. So, in such conditions, if the urine is acidic, we can just make the urine alkaline so that now the renal calculi will not be formed. In urinary tract infection, the urine should be kept acidic so that certain drugs can act. So, treatment with certain drugs like streptomycin, it is effective in urinary tract infection if urine is kept alkaline, okay. So, that is why also, you know, we are also, you know, altering the urine pH and, you know, when certain treatments are required because certain drugs are acting only at a certain pH. Now, in unexplained metabolic acidosis, measurement of urine pH is helpful in diagnosing renal tubular acidosis, okay. In renal tubular acidosis, the urine pH is consistently alkaline despite there is, uh, you know, despite of metabolic acidosis, okay. So, also for this condition. So, these are some of the important uses of measuring the urinary pH. Now, we are going to start with the chemical examination of urine, wherein individually we are going to discuss the proteins, examination glucose, ketone bodies, bilirubin, bile salts, urobilinogen, blood, hemoglobin, myoglobin and even the nitrite or leukocyte esterase test. So, in this lecture, we are just going to discuss the protein examination in details and in the next lecture, we are going to discuss all these parameters in details okay so let us begin first we are going to examine the protein so we will start with the protein examination so normally the kidneys excrete scant amount of protein in urine up to 150 milligrams for 24 hours so what are these proteins which are excreted normally by the kidneys so these proteins include proteins from the plasma like albumin proteins which are derived from our urinary tract like the tam hosphal proteins secretory immunoglobulin and proteins which are derived from the tubular epithelial cells, okay, leukocytes and other desquamated cells. So, this amount of proteinuria usually they cannot be detected by the routine qualitative test that we carry out, okay. So, basically what is TAM hosphal protein? It is a normal mucoprotein which is secreted by the ascending limb of the loop of Henle. Now, proteinuria, what is the definition? It is referring to the protein excretion in the urine which is greater than 150 milligrams per 24 hours in adults. Now, we are going to understand the different types of proteinuria. Now, mainly there are three important types, renal, pre-renal and post-renal proteinuria. Renal proteinuria can be divided under two headings into glomerular and tubular proteinuria. So, what is glomerular proteinuria? So, the proteinuria which occurs because of an increased permeability of the glomerular capillary wall is called as glomerular proteinuria. Now, again they are of two main types. One is selective, another one is non-selective. So, in the early stages of a glomerular disease, there is an increased excretion of low molecular weight proteins like albumin and transferrin. Now, when the glomeruli can retain larger molecular weight proteins but allows the passage of comparatively lower molecular weight proteins like albumin and transferrin, the proteinuria is called as selective proteinuria. That means to say that, for example, this is the glomerular basement membrane, okay, if it is allowing the passage of smaller plasma proteins, whereas it is retaining or not allowing the 
द पैसेज ऑफ लार्जर प्लाज्मा प्रोटीन इन दैट केस वी कॉल इट एज सेलेक्टिव प्रोटीन यूरिया बिकॉज सेलेक्टिवली दे आर अलाउंग ओनली द लो मॉलिकुलर वेट प्लाज्मा प्रोटीन टू पास थ्रू ओके नाउ दिस दिस इज इन केस ऑफ अर्ली ग्लोमरुलर डैमेज ओके वेर एज विथ फर्दर ग्लोमरुलर डैमेज this selectivity is lost and along with the low molecular weight proteins even the larger molecular weight proteins like the globulins they are also excreted along with albumin this is called as non selective proteinuria so i hope you have understood the concept of selective and non selective proteinuria so how to distinguish them selective and non selective proteinuria can be distinguished by carrying out urine protein electrophoresis now in case of selective proteinuria only albumin and transferrin bands are seen whereas in non selective proteinuria the pattern will resemble that of the serum uh, you know proteins so let me show you with the help of a diagram so normally you have to remember one thing that all the plasma proteins are present only in the serum okay that is in our body serum okay and only in the serum they will contain all the plasma proteins so if you carry out normal serum protein electrophoresis you will see an albumin band you will see alpha 1 alpha 2 globulin beta globulin and gamma globulin so this is the entire spectrum of the plasma protein normally none of these plasma proteins are not present in urine so normally none of the plasma proteins are not present in urine you have to remember this point okay so the first scenario over here as we see i'm talking about this first scenario so this is how the serum protein electrophoresis looks like normally with its spectrum of plasma proteins so in this first case what do we see we see just like in serum this urine protein electrophoresis shows a band over here for albumin and another band over here stands for transferrin so over here we see that only low molecular weight protein is entering in urine or they are present in urine such kind of you know proteinuria wherein the proteins are, are predominantly low molecular weight they are called as selective proteinuria this is called as selective proteinuria okay now after this we have to understand the second example over here on the uh, on the left hand side again we can see the spectrum of serum protein uh, you know uh, uh, serum plasma proteins that we see under electrophoresis okay and now we compare now we see that along with the albumin all the other larger molecular weight proteins are also appearing in the urine so both low molecular weight along with that uh, the uh, the higher molecular weight plasma proteins are also appearing and the urine protein electrophoresis is very much similar to the serum protein electrophoresis so such kind of proteinuria is called as non selective proteinuria it is called as non selective proteinuria now the third example over here that we see it is that of tubular proteinuria it is that of tubular proteinuria and we will discuss in details what tubular proteinuria is in a while right now we are discussing the glomerular proteinuria which is of two types selective as well as non selective okay so early in the course of a renal disease okay initially there will be selective proteinuria okay later on with further glomerular damage there will be non selective proteinuria so now we have, we wish to understand that what are the causes of glomerular proteinuria okay so most of the causes of glomerular proteinuria are glomerular disease that is increasing the capillary permeability of the glomerular basement membrane and it includes glomerular nephritis minimal change disease diabetes mellitus preeclampsia extreme exercise fever orthostatic or postural proteinuria so these are all the major causes of glomerular proteinuria okay major causes of glomerular proteinuria okay now one very important thing is we can also you know classify proteinuria as as asymptomatic massive moderate and mild depending on the causes so asymptomatic or functional proteinuria wherein you get very trace amount of you know uh, it is asymptomatic there is no clinical features as such okay it is very functional and it is quite transient for example extreme exercise induced or orthostatic albuminuria or pregnancy associated okay now some amount uh, you know in pregnancy you will find some amount of proteins in the urine but it is asymptomatic condition now massive proteinuria is when there is loss of more than 3 grams of protein per day what are the causes the causes are post streptococcal glomerular nephritis and nephrotic syndrome now what are the conditions which are associated with nephrotic syndrome it includes minimal change disease 
okay membranous glomerulonephritis membrana proliferative glomerulonephritis focal glomerulonephritis sle amyloid nephrosis even diabetic nephrosis so all the, of these conditions can present as a nephrotic syndrome if it is involving the kidney then we are having third condition as a moderate proteinuria wherein the loss is limited between 1 to 3 grams per day and what are the conditions associated with it chronic glomerulonephritis nephrosclerosis multiple myeloma pyelonephritis and lastly we are having mild proteinuria wherein the loss is less than 1 grams per day now the conditions wherein we have this is hypertension polycystic kidney disease chronic pyelonephritis urinary tract infections and fever okay so you might some of the examiners might also ask you a question that you know that what is massive moderate and mild proteinuria and you know also give certain examples so in that situation you can write it like this massive means more than 3 gram per day and so and so are the causes okay okay so as we have already seen that the most severe degree of proteinuria is seen in nephrotic syndrome and this syndrome is basically characterized by massive proteinuria of more than 3.5 gram per 24 hour hypoalbuminemia uh, less than 3 gram per deciliter generalized edema hyperlipidemia wherein the serum cholesterol level is more than 350 milligram per deciliter and lipid urea so you have to remember that this is one of the very important glomerular cause of proteinuria and why we are reading about so, uh, you know such clinical features because we have to you know be because this is a very important uh, topic nephrotic syndrome and many you know uh, problem based cards you comes in your practical okay so many problem based card problem based card comes based on nephrotic syndrome okay not only that some of them also comes for example based out of on glomerulonephritis condition okay both nephritic and nephrotic syndrome can come as a problem based exam card okay now very importantly there are two other special types of glomerular proteinuria what are those they are hemodynamic proteinuria and postural or orthostatic proteinuria so what are hemodynamic and postural proteinuria so first we will see the hemodynamic proteinuria now whenever there is an alteration of the blood flow through the glomerulus sometimes can cause increased filtration of protein so there is some hemodynamic alteration in the flow of blood which is causing you know increased filtration of proteins now protein excretion however in such conditions is transient and temporary it is seen in conditions of high fever hypertension heavy exercise congestive cardiac failure seizures and exposure to cold now postural or orthostatic proteinuria occurs when the patient or the subject is standing or is ambulatory that means he is walking or he is standing but it is absent when the person is lying down or in the recumbent position most commonly it is seen in adolescents okay three to five percent of the adolescents you know they are having orthostatic proteinuria and probably it occurs because of the posture or because of the lordotic posture that causes the uh, inferior vena cava compression between the liver and the vertebral column. The condition disappears in adulthood. Amount of proteinuria is less than 1 gram per day or less than 1000 milligram per day. So when you are standing, there will be proteinuria and when you are lying down, there is no proteinuria. Basically, it is because of the posture of the spine. In the standing position, the inferior vena cava compression occurs between the liver and the vertebral column because of which this proteinuria occurs and usually it, uh, it starts in adolescence and basically it disappears in adulthood. So, these are the two important types of glomerular proteinuria that is hemodynamic and postural proteinuria. Now, the second important variety of renal proteinuria that we are uh, coming across is the tubular variety of proteinuria. Now, normally, if you see the glomerular membrane, although impermeable to high molecular weight proteins, they allow ready passage to low molecular weight proteins like beta 2 microglobulin, retinol binding protein, lysozyme, alpha 1 microglobulin and free immunoglobulin lysine. So, normally, all these uh, low molecular weight proteins, they are freely excreted or not excreted, they are freely, uh, you know, uh, 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 filtered by the glomerulus. But these low molecular weight proteins after being filtered from the glomerulus are also actively reabsorbed by the tubules, especially in the proximal renal tubules. Now, in diseases involving mainly the tubules, these proteins that is the beta 2 microglobulin, retinol binding protein, lysozyme, all these or alpha 1 microglobulin, all these proteins, they start to getting excreted in urine while albumin excretion is minimal, is not seen. Albumin excretion is not seen in case of tubular proteinuria so in case of tubular proteinuria what is happening the renal tubules have become diseased so those proteins low molecular weight proteins which are normally filtered by the glomerulus and again reabsorbed okay they fail to get reabsorbed because the 
tubules are not functioning properly and as a result uh, in the protein electrophoresis we are going to see, see prominent alpha and beta bands okay we will see the beta 2 microglobulin we will see the alpha 1 microglobulin okay so where the low molecular weight proteins migrate and the albumin band is very faint usually albumin is not very prominent in tubular proteinuria so let me just take you back over here as i told you i will come back to that again so again this is the control this is the normal serum electrophoresis with its entire you know uh, uh, plasma proteins now over here what we can see the albumin the albumin is very faint the albumin band is very faint over here whereas the other uh, uh, bands including the uh, you know alpha and the beta globulin bands are present over here so you can see the alpha 1 alpha 2 and the beta so these bands are present over here in case of tubular proteinuria why they are present because there is failure of reabsorption of these low molecular weight protein but over here you cannot see albumin so this is classically the third very important type that is the tubular proteinuria which is again a type of renal proteinuria okay now after having read about the tubular proteinuria now yes now before we go into the next type of proteinuria very important thing is that what are the causes where do you see the tubular type of proteinuria you've seen in those conditions which is involving the tubules for example acute and chronic pyelonephritis heavy metal poisoning tuberculosis of the kidneys interstitial nephritis panconi syndrome and rejection of the kidney transplant now purely tubular proteinuria cannot be detected by reagent strip test which is sensitive to albumin only but heat and acetic acid and sulfosalicyclic acid test are positive so we have to keep this thing in our mind and we will discuss in detail about that in the later part of the video now the second very important type of proteinuria as we can understand is the prerenal prerenal means that the causes are lying before the kidney this is also called as overflow proteinuria now when the concentration of a particular low molecular weight protein rises in plasma it starts to overflow from the plasma into the urine such proteins are nothing but the immunoglobulin light chains or the benz jones proteins okay we call it as the immunoglobulin light chains or the benz jones protein which is seen mainly in plasma cell dyscrasias like multiple myeloma primary amyloidosis okay hemoglobin okay hemoglobin can also overflow in conditions of intravascular hemolysis myoglobin in condition of skeletal muscle trauma lysozyme in condition of aml m4 m5 type and in infections and inflammation so whenever a certain low molecular weight protein okay increases in, in amount because of any condition as for example immunoglobulin light chains they have increased in amount in multiple myeloma so they start coming to an in you know in urine for example in intravascular hemolysis lots of rbc's break down so hemoglobin is released so they start entering the urine similarly myoglobin in case of skeletal muscle trauma lysozyme so all these things they start to overflow this is called as pre renal proteinuria or overflow proteinuria and lastly we are having post renal proteinuria which is mainly caused by inflammatory or neoplastic conditions involving either the renal pelvis ureter bladder prostate or urethra okay so these are the causes of of post renal proteinuria now remember post renal proteinuria basically uh, it is obstructive in nature okay it is causing obstruction because of any kind of inflammation or neoplastic condition so there is a obstruction over here so this is a post renal proteinuria okay now we are going to start with the qualitative and the quantitative estimation of the protein now very importantly first we are going to see the qualitative estimation of protein because this is what is mainly asked in the exams and you might also be asked to perform these tests so it becomes very important for you to perform these important tests so what are the most important tests that is there there is a heat and acetic acid test which is called as the boiling test we have the reagent strip test sulfosalicyclic acid test then we have the hellers nitric acid test okay now before we proceed okay we just want to tell you one important thing that all these tests okay you have to remember the names at least and this is the test that is the heat uh, and acetic acid test this is the test that you usually ideally have to perform in your exam so everything about all these tests all the theoretical parts has to be known and you have to perform this test also and i will show you how to perform the heat and acetic acid test we will come to the quantitative estimation of proteins after we complete the qualitative estimation of proteins so uh, first we are going to start the qualitative estimation of proteins so if you see over here there is a heat and acetic acid test also called as the boiling test so the first important question in your exam is that what is the principle of this test so the 
basic principle is that that the proteins get precipitated when boiled in an acidic solution okay so heat precipitation is basically the major uh, you know principle okay so the method is the urine has to be clear if it is not then you should filter or use supernatant from the centrifuge sample the urine should be just acidic you should check it with the litmus paper if it is not acidic then you should add 10% acetic acid drop by drop until the blue litmus paper is turning red now what is the method how do you carry out the test the test tube has to be filled up till two thirds with urine now the tube is inclined at an angle and the upper portion is boiled upper 2 cm portion is boiled over the flame now only the upper portion is heated so that the convection currents generated by the heat do not disturb the precipitate and the upper portion can be compared with the lower clear portion so it is always the upper 2 cm portion that you should heat okay now after you heat you compare the heated part with the lower part cloudiness or turbidity indicates the presence of either phosphates or proteins now a few drops of 10% acetic acid are added and the upper portion is boiled again now turbidity because of phosphates is going to disappear on heating whereas that because of proteins is going to remain okay they will not disappear they will remain so this is the basic method and the basic principle of the heat and acetic acid test so you can appreciate over here so this is basically a test tube so you have inclined over here and with the help of a dropper uh, with the help of a holder okay over here you are heating it okay now now very important thing is that you should always heat this this upper portion has to be heated okay always this upper 2 uh, cm has to be heated okay and you will see that after you heat the upper portion becomes cloudy and the lower portion is clear now this means that either phosphates are present or proteins are there so how do you confirm you just add uh, you know few drops of uh, uh, acetic acid and then you reheat again if the cloudiness remains okay then in that case it is diagnostic of presence of proteins if the cloudiness if the cloudiness disappears okay in that case it is it uh, you know the haziness of the turbidity was because of the presence of phosphates okay now very importantly we are going to see some of the other very important gradations of the cloudiness that we see whether it is 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus so these tests that is the heat uh, you know heat and acid uh, precipitation of the protein test okay uh, you know they are having some kind of of gradation as well so let us see if there is no cloudiness then the test comes out to be negative now barely visible cloudiness there will be trace 1 plus there is a definite cloud without any granular flocculation two is heavy and granular cloud without any kind of flocculation there is no flocculation over here but granularity comes three plus means a dense cloud along with that flocculation is there and four plus means that along with flocculation you can see very thick curdy precipitate along with coagulation so let me show you uh, here is a very important example okay of the different grades of you know proteinuria that we can appreciate so over here you can you can see that there is no cloudiness so this is basically a negative test you can see very faint haziness over here so this is trace now over here what you can appreciate is the presence of some cloudiness is there but there is no granularity as such so this is 1 plus and no flocculants over here this is number 2 what you can appreciate over here that along with the cloudiness there is some amount of granularity which is present so it becomes 2 plus over here you can see very dot dot flocules have now arrived so there is heavy flocculation that is can be seen over here so this is 3 plus and 4 plus you can see a thick curdy white precipitate that is form an entire coagulation happened over here you can see the entire coagulum over here so this is basically the 4 plus okay so this is the basic very important grading of proteinuria that we see 1 plus is definitive cloud without granular flocculation 2 plus is heavy and granular cloud without flocculation 3 plus is dense cloud with flocculation 4 is thick curdy precipitate and coagulation the next very important test is the reagent strip test now in this test what is the principle now the reagent area this is the strip and this is the reagent area so the reagent area of the strip is coated with an indicator what is the name of the indicator bromophenol blue indicator and this indicator over here it has been buffered to an acidic ph of 3.0 with the help of citrate now this indicator is going to change color if there is any presence of proteins okay so this principle is also called as the protein error of indicators okay so let us try and understand and justify what the principle is so when the dye is getting adsorbed to the protein okay so suppose over here the dye is already there okay and suppose we have added a protein we have add, add, added a drop of urine which is containing protein 
So when the dye is getting adsorbed to a protein, only then there is a change in ionization and hence the change in pH of the indicator that leads to the change in color of the indicator that is bromophenol blue. Now the intensity of the color which is produced is proportional to the concentration of the protein. Therefore, this test is also semi-quantitative in nature. Okay, so let me just show you. Now for example, over here there, there was an indicator dye. Okay, and the urine okay, was poured on this particular dye. Now that urine did not contain any albumin. So basically, uh, uh, there was no change in color and the color remained as yellow. This was the original color. Now, for example, in the second condition, now the urine is containing albumin. So whenever that urine is added to this indicator dye, okay, uh, so that color from yellow changes to bluish green. And the, this change in color is confirmatory that a protein is present. And the intensity of this bluish green color will correlate with the concentration of protein. Therefore, this test is also semi-quantitative. Now, the reagent strip test that we are using, they are mainly reactive to albumin only. It is false negative in presence of other proteins like Benz John protein, myoglobin or hemoglobin. So, in all the conditions of pre-renal proteinuria or in conditions of overflow proteinuria, they are not detected by the reagent strip test. So, the overload or Benz John proteinuria as well as the tubular proteinuria may be missed entirely if only reagent strip test is used. This test should be followed by sulfosalicyclic acid test, which is a confirmatory test. Okay. Now, always remember one important thing that highly alkaline urine or in cases of gross hematuria or contamination with vaginal secretions can also give false positive reactions with the reagent strip test. Okay. So, this is all about the reagent strip test. Okay. Now, if you see over here, yes, this is classically how the reagent strip is looking like, okay. So, you can see that when the albumin is absent, okay, then we are getting a yellow color, okay. But when it becomes positive, then you can see a bluish green, a bluish green color can be appreciated. And as you see over here, as the intensity of this color is increasing, Therefore, the, you know, the, the concentration of protein which is present is also there, okay. So, this test is semi-quantitative. So, if you just get, you know, you are using a particular dye and you see a change in color, that color has to be matched against all of them, okay. Okay, it has to be matched against all of them. So, depending on the, you know, uh, depending on the color that is matching, uh, it can either be 1 plus corresponding to 30 milligram per deciliter, 2 plus 100 3 plus or 4 plus proteinuria. So, this is how it is semi quantitative. Basically, the reagent strip test is used to detect as low as 20 milligram per deciliter of albumin in urine, as in cases of early kidney disease like diabetes mellitus. Now, the next important, uh, you know, confirmatory test that we use, okay, because the reagent strip test is not confirmatory, to confirm that we have to go for either heat and acetic acid test or you have to go for sulfosalicyclic acid test. Now, the basic principle over here is now the heat test, there was a heat precipitation because of the heat, the protein was getting, you know, precipitated. The second one was the protein error of indicators and this test is basically there is a use of a acid. So, this is acid precipitation. So, addition of sulfosalicyclic acid to the urine causes formation of a white precipitate if proteins are present. Proteins are denatured by organic acids and they precipitate out of solution. So, the basic principle over here is acid precipitation. What is the method? The specimen has to be centrifuged and the clear supernatant is only used. You have to take 2 ml of the clear urine sample in a test tube. If reaction of the urine is neutral or alkaline, then we have to make it acidic by adding drop of glacial acetic acid. Around 2 to 3 drops of sulfosalicyclic acid, around 3 to 5 percent sulfosalicyclic acid is then added and examined for turbidity against a dark background. Now, the test is more sensitive and reliable as compared to the boiling test. Now, false positive test might occur if any radiographic contrast dye was used three days prior or if there is excess amount of uric acid or tolbutamide, sulfonamide, salicylates or penicillin drug is there in the body. False negative test can occur with very dilute urine. Now, the test can detect almost all the plasma proteins like albumin, hemoglobin, myoglobin, benzogen protein. So, it can detect not only renal proteinuria but it can also detect Tubular proteinuria along with that can detect overflow of pre-renal proteinuria as well. That is why this test becomes very, very important. Now, this is how the sulfosalicyclic acid test looks like as you can appreciate over here. So, whatever cloudiness we are doing, we are basically, you know, uh, 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 comparing the cloudiness against a very dark background. So, you can appreciate again that 
This is the trace wherein uh, this is corresponding to less than 0 0.01 gram percentage. This is 1 plus which is corresponding to 0.01 to 0.5 gram percentage of protein in urine. 2 plus corresponding to 0.05 to 0.2 gram percentage. 3 plus corresponding to 0.2 to 0.5 gram percentage and this is 4 plus corresponding to more than 0.5 gram percentage protein in the urine. Okay. Now we are going to understand about the quantitative estimation of proteins. Now before we go into the quantitative estimation of protein, I, uh, you know there was one more method of qualitative estimation of protein that I, uh, that I did not discuss. So let, let me just show you. Yes, this was the basic test that is the Heller's nitric acid test. Now usually the, you know this test is obsolete, no one uses it. But some examiners they are asking because they are old examiners so in their time they used to carry out this. So that is why. You should just mention about the Heller's nitric acid test. So, this is basically carried out. You take 1 ml of concentrated nitric acid in a test tube and to that you add 2 ml of urine by the side of the test tube and form a layer on top of the acid. So, you will see that a whitish ring is formed at the junction of the two fluid when albumin is present. Okay. So, this is the Heller's nitric acid test. Okay. Now, we are going to understand about the quantitative estimation of protein. So, we have seen the qualitative. Now, you all understand qualitative means they will detect just the whether protein is present or not and they can give you some quantification. But quantitative estimation of urine, basically it is going to exactly quantitate how much amount of, of protein is there. So, basically quantitative estimation of protein is required for diagnosis of nephrotic syndrome, for detection of microalbuminuria or early diabetic nephropathy and to follow response to therapy in case of renal disease. Now, basically, if you see, if you see the amount of proteinuria, you can understand the underlying disorder. Now, if the proteinuria is more than 1.5 grams per 24 hour or more than 1500 milligrams per 24 hour, it is indicating that there is some problem in the glomerulus. So, it is indicative of a glomerular disease. If it is more than 3500 milligram or more than 3.5 grams per 24 hour, it is called as nephrotic range proteinuria. In tubular Hemodynamic post renal disease, the proteinuria is usually less than 1500 milligram per 24 hour. So, very importantly, knowing the amount of proteinuria that is taking place, you can get an idea about the underlying disorder or disease. Now, very importantly, before we go ahead, we have seen you know what is proteinuria, but we have to understand the grading of albuminuria. So, basically, plasma proteins comprises along with albumin there are other proteins also and albumin is the most common plasma protein okay but albumin concentration doesn't reflect the total protein concentration understand so there is separate grading of albuminuria and why it is important i will tell you normally there is less than 30 milligrams per 24 hour of albumin okay now in microalbuminuria the range is 30 to 300 milligrams per 24 hour and this is a very important short note as well as viva question as to what is microalbuminuria we will discuss about this in details then what is overt albuminuria wherein there is more than 300 milligram per 24 hour of albumin in urine now there are two important methods for quantitative estimation of proteins number one is estimation of proteins in a 24 hour urine sample and number two is estimation of protein creatinine ratio in a random urine sample so first very importantly we are going to see the quantitative estimation of protein in a 24 hour urine sample so very importantly we have to understand that there are various methods that is in place for quantitative estimation of proteins out of that the most common one is the esbash's albuminometer method other methods are turbidimetric method, biuret reaction, immunologic method. But the most commonly followed test is the Esbash's albuminometer method. So, let us try and understand about this method because this might be kept in your exam as you know one instrument. So, basically the principle is that the picric acid is used to precipitate the protein and the amount of protein precipitated is measured by volume not a very accurate method. So, what are the materials which are required for it? We require Esbash's albuminometer as Bash's reagent comprising of picric acid 10 grams which is going to precipitate albumin, citric acid 20 grams which is going to dissolve the phosphate if any they are present and distilled water to 1 liter or 1000 ml. Then 24 hour filtered and acidified urine sample with a specific gravity below 1.025. Now how a 24 hour sample is collected we have already read this. Okay. 
So this is classically how the s bashes albuminometer looks like. Okay, you will see that there are two gradations R and U, and then there are several gradations over here as we can appreciate. Okay, I will explain you what it is. So basically, what has happened that this albuminometer is filled with a filtered acidified urine of correct specific gravity, that means less than 1.025. Up to the mark U. So, up to this mark U, the albuminometer is filled with filtered acidified urine. Now, the s bashes reagent is then added till, you know, till the mark R is achieved. Okay. So, the s bashes reagent is added till the mark R is mixed. Okay. And then this mixture is mixed well. The tube is cocked as you can appreciate over here and kept vertically in the stand for 24 hours. Now, what happens that after 24 hours, you are going to appreciate, okay the precipitate. So, the level of precipitate is measured against a graduation tube, graduation of the tube. So, for example, there, there are many levels, okay. So, for example, there is a, you know, levels of precipitate came till this level, till number 7, for example, okay. So, the reading at the level of the precipitate in the tube is given in grams per liter. When it is divided by 10, it is going to give gram percentage, okay. So, remember one thing that normally kidneys excrete very scant amount of protein in urine up to 150 milligrams per 24 hour or basically it is 0.15 gram per 24 hour, okay. Now, proteinuria as I told you, if it is more than 1500 milligram per 24 hour, it indicates glomerular disease. If it is more than 3500 milligram per 24 hour, it is a nephrotic range proteinuria. In all other cases like tubular variety or hemodynamic or post renal cases, it is less than 1500 milligrams uh, per 24 hours, okay. So, this is the s bashes albuminometer and I have already spoken about how you can quantitate the urine in a 24 hour urine sample, okay. The next important method for quantitative estimation of protein is estimation of protein creatinine ratio in a random urine sample. Now, because of the problem of incomplete collection of a 24 hour urine sample, Many laboratories measure protein creatinine ratio in a random urine sample, okay. Before we go into that, the protein creatinine ratio in a sample, let me just tell you one thing. In adult males, the creatinine excretion is around 14 to 26 milligram per kg per 24 hour and in women, it is 11 to 20 milligram per kg per 24 hour. So, let me with this uh, idea in our mind, we are going to see. So, what happens that we are going to measure the protein creatinine ratio in a random urine sample. Okay, so normal protein creatinine ratio is less than 0.2. In a low grade proteinuria, it is 0.2 to 1.0. In moderate proteinuria, it is 1 to 3.5. And in nephrotic range proteinuria, it becomes more than 3.5. Okay, now there are certain important points which are classically asked in your exams in your viva. And microalbuminuria is a very important short note in exam that comes. So, it is defined as a urinary excretion of 30 to 300 milligrams per 24 hours of albumin, not protein, of albumin. So, what is the significance of microalbuminuria? It is considered as the earliest sign of renal damage in diabetes mellitus. Okay, it indicates an increase in capillary permeability to albumin and denotes a microvascular disease. Microalbuminuria precedes the development of diabetic nephropathy by few years. That means, Microalbuminuria starts few years before diabetic nephropathy results. So, if blood glucose level and hypertension are tightly regulated at this early stage by aggressive treatment, then progression to irreversible renal disease and subsequent renal failure can be delayed or completely prevented. Okay. So, microalbuminuria is, uh, you know, is very significant. If you identify that, that means you can quickly control the patient's blood glucose and, and uh, sugar and uh, pressure levels and you can prevent overt, uh, you know, renal failure in such patients. Also, microalbuminuria is an independent risk factor for cardiovascular disease and diabetes mellitus. Now, how do you detect microalbumin? Now, by routine qualitative test, you cannot detect, uh, 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 you know, uh, microalbuminuria. So, the methods include measurement of albumin creatinine ratio in a random urine sample, Measurement of albumin in an early morning or random urine sample. Measurement of albumin in a 24-hour urine sample. Now, test strips that screen for microalbuminuria are also available commercially. An exact quantitation can now be done by immunological assays like radioimmunoassay or by ELISA assay. Okay. Okay. Now, another very important, you know, viva question that will be 100% asked to everyone. If you are getting, you know, this protein test as a part of your practical exam, that is Ben's Jones proteinuria. 
Now, Benz John protein proteins are nothing but they are monoclonal immunoglobulin light chains, okay, either kappa or lambda light chains, okay, that are synthesized by neoplastic plasma cells. Now, before I go further, let me make you understand one important thing. Basically, multiple myeloma, it is a disorder of or it's a neoplasia affecting plasma cells. So, what happens that this neoplastic plasma cells, they start to secrete an excess amount of immunoglobulin, especially the IgG class, okay. And once the IgG immunoglobulins are increased, are synthesizing increased quantities, they also have light chains, okay. So, either kappa or lambda, in any tumor, either lambda or kappa light chain is going to increase in amount, okay. And these immunoglobulin light chains, they are called as benzjohn protein. So, these are actually the benzjohn protein, okay. Understand? So, what are benzjohn protein? These are monoclonal immunoglobulin light chains of either kappa or, or uh, you know, uh, uh, lambda variety that are synthesized by neoplastic plasma cells. Now, excess production of these light chains occurs in plasma cell disorders like multiple myeloma and primary amyloidosis. Because of their low molecular weight and high concentration, they are excreted in urine and this is called as overflow proteinuria. Now, benz John proteins, they have a very characteristic thermal behavior. What is that behavior? When heated, the benz John protein will precipitate at a temperature of 40 to 60 degree. Okay, so it is precipitating at a lower temperature in comparison to other proteins which normally precipitate at around 60 to 70 degrees and this uh, protein disappears that is the benz John protein disappears on further heating to 85 to 100. So, benz John protein what will happen that they precipitate earlier around 40 to 60 degrees centigrade. On further heating the precipitate disappears okay around 85 to 100 degrees centigrade. Now, again if this protein is again cooled down to 40 to, you know, when cooled, when cooled to again around 60 to 85 degree centigrade, again that precipitate of benzene protein will reappear. So, at 40 to 60 degrees, what is going to happen? First time the precipitate is going to appear, okay. At 85 to 100, the precipitate is going to disappear and on cooling to 60 to 85 degree centigrade, again, you know, the precipitate will start to reappear, okay. So, this is the classical characteristic feature of a basic uh, normal, uh, you know, not normal, this is the classical feature of benz John proteinuria, okay. So, very important thing is at lower temperature of 40 to 60 degrees centigrade, uh, most of the proteins they do not precipitate, they precipitate at around 60 to 70 degrees, okay. Whereas, at 100 degree centigrade, okay, all the other proteins, they remain in the precipitate form only, okay. So, they remain precipitated. Okay, this is very, very important to understand what is benz John proteinuria. I will just read it again once more so that uh, uh, this concept becomes clear to everyone. Okay, so benz John proteins, they have a characteristic thermal behavior. When heated, the benz John proteins, they will precipitate at a temperature of 40 to 60 degree. Other proteins, they precipitate at a higher temperature of 60 to 70. So, the benz John protein, they precipitate soon. Also, the benz John protein precipitate, they will disappear on further heating to 85 to 100 degree. At this temperature, all the other proteins precipitate are present, whereas the benz John protein, you know, their precipitate, they disappear. Again, when they are cooled back to 60 to 85 degree, there is a reappearance of the precipitate of benz John protein. So, this is the characteristic feature of benz John protein. However, you have to remember one important point over here that this test, Okay, this test by which we are carrying out benz John, you know, by which we are detecting the benz John protein urea, it is not very specific for benz John protein because this benz John protein urea, this test can come out to be positive in other disorders also like malignant lymphoma, CML, osteosarcoma, osteomalacia, or generalized carcinomatosis. In all these other conditions, the benz John protein test can come out to be positive. Therefore, this method of estimation of, uh, of uh, presence or absence of benzion protein by just heating. This heating method is not very sensitive because many other, uh, you know, conditions can, you know, cause, you know, uh, uh, such, you know, uh, characteristic thermal behavior. So, this test, however, is not specific for benzion protein and both false positive and false negative test results can occur. So, the test has been replaced by a more specific protein electrophoresis of concentrated urine sample. So, we carry out protein electrophoresis which is a more specific test. Mainly the benz protein is seen in conditions of plasma cell dyscrasias 
like multiple myeloma and primary amyloidosis. Remember, this is the true condition. Okay, this is the true condition. These are other conditions which can cause Benz Jones proteinuria. Okay, so as a, these are very non specific conditions. Okay, non specific. So basically, this test, this urine test that we are doing, they can actually uh, you know come out to be positive in these conditions, and therefore, this test is non specific. Okay. So basically what we do over here that we are now carrying out urine protein electrophoresis. Now this is a control sample, uh, you know this is a control serum sample. Normally our serum is showing this band albumin alpha 1, alpha 2 glo globulin, beta globulin, gamma globulin like this. But what happens in case of you know you are carrying out urine electrophoresis, you are carrying out urine electrophoresis. So if you compare it with the serum electrophoresis, you will see that a very dark band is formed over here in the gamma region. And this dark band is nothing but that for Benz John protein. This is nothing but the immunoglobulin light chain. Okay, this is immunoglobulin light. Now, whether it is kappa or whether it is lambda, that we can, you know, uh, know if we carry out further tests like immunofixation is done, then we can understand whether it is kappa or lambda. Okay, so this is very important. You will see a very dark band uh, in case of Benz John protein. So, with this, we have completed in details uh, about the protein examination and in the next uh, class we are going to start with the remaining ones that is the glucose uh, ketone bodies and uh, we will see the blood uh, along with that uh, bilirubin and bile pigments okay so thank you very much for watching this particular video